Good morning, young persons. Welcome to the High School Wood Shop. We're going to go through a series of videos that will show us how to come into the shop, build some cool stuff, and be safe while doing it. Nobody enters a shop environment with the intention of having an accident because, by definition, an accident is an unplanned event. Accidents are avoided by thinking through what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you're driving a car, playing sports, or simply preparing a meal at home in your kitchen. Establishing good habits is the key to avoiding accidents. In these videos, there are six key areas that we're going to look at to avoid having an accident here in the shop. Number one, you're going to prepare yourself to work in the shop. Number two, you're going to prepare the machine to be used. Number three, you're going to check the material carefully. Number four, use the machine correctly. Number five, deal with the unexpected. And number six, please use common sense. These are going to be just general guidelines for working in the wood shop. We're going to discuss specific instructions for each machine in a separate video. Okay, number one, prepare yourself. Working in a shop while tired, sick, or under the influence of drugs or alcohol is never allowed. It's a frequent cause of accidents including injury and it can get you fired from your job. When we talk about drugs, we could be talking about over-the-counter drugs such as uh, NyQuil that makes you sleepy. Long hair, loose clothing, and hanging jewelry in the shop must be removed or restrained. If your hang hangs below your chin when you lean forward, it's too long and it must be dealt with. You must take off sandals or flip-flops and put on closed-toe shoes before you start work. Gloves are not allowed to be worn when using machines in the wood shop. Safety glasses must be worn in the shop when machines are running, unless you're seated at the table. Safety glasses protect your eyes from dust, small flying pieces of wood, and blunt trauma. Everyday eyeglasses are not safety glasses. Occasionally, you may need to pick up something heavy in the shop, like a large board or a machine. To correctly lift a heavy object, you should always lift with your back straight, lift with your legs, and get help when necessary. That means that you'll be straightening your back before you begin using your legs. Number two. Prepare the machine to be used. Remember, these are general guidelines for using the tools and machines that we find here in the wood shop. We're going to discuss specific instructions for each machine in a separate video. The first thing I want you to remember is, is that if you are unsure or you just basically forgot how to use a machine or what it was that I instructed you on, just ask me again. I will not mind repeating myself to show you how to use the machine correctly. I don't want you to use the machine not knowing what you're doing because you're too embarrassed to ask me. I don't mind repeating myself. Unsafe or broken machines should be left alone and reported to the instructor. Before you use a machine, I want you to check and make sure that any keys, or adjusting wrenches are removed from the machine before turning on the power. For example, if the chuck key is left in the spindle on the uh, drill press and you turn that machine on, that chuck key is going to go flying across the classroom and maybe hurt somebody. Number three, let's check the material. You're going to want to check the material, especially if it's used, for embedded nails or screws. You're going to want to check the material for being straight and true. Most of the machines in here require at least one side to be flat and straight, and some of the machines require the material to be flat and straight on two adjoining sides. Number four, use the machine correctly. 
Talking with a machine operator is dangerous and must wait until the machine is off. If something goes wrong when using a machine, the first thing to do is to stop working and back away from the machine. I don't want you to do something like lean down to turn off the power switch because that might be bringing your face closer to where the problem is. Woodworking power tools are designed so that the direction that the wood moves through the tool is in opposite direction of the cutter head. This is particularly true on the router table, which we're going to talk about when we get to the router table. When you're standing at a machine, you want to stand with a good balance. Avoid awkward operations and hand positions where a sudden slip could cause your hand to move into a cutting tool or a blade. Generally, do not use woodworking machines in such a way that your body is in line with the path of the saw blade, particularly with the table saw, the miter saw, and a handheld a portable circular saw. Do not force material through a machine. If it requires excess or extra force to accomplish what you're trying to do, ask me for help. Perhaps the saw blade is getting dull, or your technique is, uh, needs a little adjustment, but uh, we'll figure it out together. I want you to come and ask me. When you're using the machine and you've finished what you're trying to do, do not reach over the blade or around the blade while it's still moving to uh, remove cutoffs or to pick up your work or anything else. Turn the machine off, wait till the blade comes to a complete stop, and then do what you need to do. Do not leave a machine until the power switch is turned off and the machine comes to a complete stop. Keep your work area free of clutter, clean, and well swept. Spills should be cleaned up immediately. Good housekeeping practices will help reduce accidents due to slips, trips, and falls. Number five, learn to deal with the unexpected. Avoid distractions and avoid being a distraction. Distractions are a part of everyday life, and working in the wood shop is no different. When you are summoned or distracted while working with power tools and machines, remember to always finish the cut to a safe conclusion before dealing with that distraction. Taking your attention away from your work and the machine, even just for a moment, it's a recipe for disaster. If there is an injury here in the shop, I don't care how small it is, even if it's just a sliver. It's required to be reported to me, the instructor. I'm gonna keep track of things that are going on in the shop, and if kids are picking up slivers from something that we're doing, even though it's just a sliver, I wanna know about it and we'll deal with it. Remember if there is a cut, a small cut, a large cut, the first step in dealing with a bleeding injury is to apply direct pressure. There are many different things that we're going to worry about with a uh, bleeding wound, such as cleaning the wound to prevent infection. However, we're always going to start with applying direct pressure. We're going to use some cloth or a, a bandage and uh, we'll hold it on the wound until bleeding stops. Next thing we're going to talk about here in the wood shop is fires. Fire is a uh, hazard working in the shop because we have a lot of sawdust around and we also use uh, paint thinners and finishes that are highly flammable. There are three things required for fire to occur. Number one, heat. Two, fuel. And number three, oxygen. We classify fires uh, three ways. Uh, a class A fire is wood and paper is the fuel. A class B fire involves burning oil or gas. Class B fire is electrical or, or electrical equipment. The classification on fires is so that we know how to fight the fire. It used to be that most uh, fire extinguishers in a school building would just simply be a canister full of water that was under pressure. And if there's a fire, you spray water on the fire to put it out. Nowadays, we have other type of fire to take into consideration, such as oil or gas or electrical. So a modern fire extinguisher that you're going to find in your standard classroom, such as this one, has a dry white powder in it. So the 
uh, wood and paper fire, if you spray water on it, that's going to put out the fire by number one, uh, removing heat because the water is cool, and number two, it's removing fuel from the fire by cooling off the material that's burning. So uh, with an oil and gas fire, of course, you don't spray water on it. If you have a frying pan on your stove at home and it catches on fire, and you dump a bunch of water on it to put the fire out, what it's gonna do is it's gonna catch your house on fire. Because oil floats. The oil's on fire, you throw water on it, and the oil splashes up on your wall, it splashes on your cabinets, and pretty soon half your kitchen's engulfed in flames. What do they tell you to do? Ever since you're a little kid, they tell you, just take a, uh, a lid from one of your pots and put it on top of the frying pan to put out the fire. What's that doing? It's removing oxygen from the fire to put it out. Or you could even just use a kitchen towel and put it on top of the fire and the fire is going to go out before the towel catches on fire because it's removing oxygen from the fire. An electrical fire, you want to spray water on it because water conducts electricity. So what do we do? We have a fire extinguisher such as this. It's very simple to use. You pull the pin you remove the hose, you aim it at the base of the fire, and you squeeze the trigger. If you forget that, because a lot of times if there's a fire, you might be very nervous and you have a hard time getting your wits together, just read the label on the fire extinguisher and it will tell you exactly what to do. Notice that the fire extinguisher is, uh, has the letters on here for which classification fire it fights, A, B, and C. That means it's going to have a white powder inside this for fighting fire. I'm going to point out that this fire extinguisher is not used for putting out a building fire. The purpose of this fire extinguisher is for the health and safety of the people in the building. If the building catches on fire, we are not going to run through the building and collect these fire extinguishers and try to put this building fire out. What we're going to do is we're going to go outside, call 911 and let the professionals do it. However, if a person were on fire, for example, if they had a flammable liquid splashed on them and it ignites, then we could use this fire extinguisher to put that out. And the other one is if we're in the building, and when the building's on fire, and we don't have a way to get out past the flames, then we could use a fire extinguisher like this to create a path to safely leave the building. That's it. Number six, use common sense. All students are responsible for safety in the shop. You're responsible for following the shop rules, following my directions, and you are responsible for your own behavior. If you will listen to me and follow my directions, you will not get hurt in my shop. Do not become complacent, which means do not allow familiarity gain from your frequent use of using the machines to compromise your use of safety rules and procedures. You're using this machine a lot. You might come to the point where you feel like you've mastered the machine and not all of the rules and procedures that we learn apply anymore. You're gonna use the machine and you haven't put your safety glasses on yet. They're over there in the drawer and you're like, well, I know how to use this machine. So I don't really need to worry about that. I'm not gonna have a problem. I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. It's how you're going to get hurt. Most accidents in the shop have uh, complacency as a factor. Finally, as with all tools and techniques in the wood shop, if a procedure feels unsafe, it probably is. Stop. Come and talk to me about it. We'll put our heads together and we'll find another way to do what needs to be done. I don't want you to continue doing something that you are not comfortable with or that you're unsafe with. You guys ready? Now let's make something cool.